Well, good morning. I've just ventured to the tip. It was wonderful. Half my garden's now gone and my car's breathing a sigh of relief. Anyway, that's irrelevant. Today, I'm reading you another chapter from No Naked Walls. Beautiful artwork by Glenn. Story by me, Lee Benson. And we're in book three, which is Now You're the Artist, Deal With It. And this is Act 7, Scene 1, chapter... 15, I don't know, it doesn't really matter, as long as you're following me. And you can follow me on Amazon, on my author page, and I'm on Instagram as the Lee Benson, and I'm on Twitter as Lee Benson 55 and I'm also on Facebook as Lee Benson, and Lee's Art, and Lee's Books, and Henry Egg, who's my children's uh, alter ego. But here we go, Act 7, Scene 1. Majorca is a lovely island in the Balearics. I've been invited out on a 10-day course to give a few lectures about art and presentation, and due to careful planning, have arrived early and having sorted somewhere to stay in Parma. Strange enough, on getting there, I can't help noticing that my hearing is detecting a lot of Teutonic accents. Not being too savvy on the web surfing, searching as I call it, I've booked a reasonably priced hotel just outside the capital. At the hotel on checking in, in the very pretty receptionist looks at my passport and then straight to me and states, This is a German hotel. You are English. I only want to stay one night. Is that okay? But this is a German hotel and everyone in the hotel is German. Great. I don't have to speak to anyone then. What time is breakfast served? It's at 8 o'clock. Until breakfast is served at 8 a.m. She stamps the paperwork, hands me the key and turns to her assistant, addressing her in German, and that's it. I'm checked in. I dump my bag and stroll outside to find a quiet bar. It's still strange being on a Spanish island and all you can hear are German-speaking people. I stroll past three very loud and full bars and enter the fourth. The music's a bit umpa umpa, but bearable, so I order a large beer and find an empty table. I quickly take out my small sketchbook and try to capture the atmosphere. Ten minutes go by, and a large gent of huge girth strolls up to my table. Herr Englander. The very one. Ja, I hear you are staying at my hotel. Do I really stand out that much? It's a very rare occurrence. In fact, it's the first. I didn't ask him how he knew who I was. Am I being followed? Your hotel looks very nice and clean, and the room is fine, thank you. Why have you chosen my hotel? I guess it was a lucky dip that did it. Fancy a beer? I don't drink with my clients or guests, and I don't let my staff do either. Okay. Permit me for asking you once again, why my hotel? Is there any reason as to why I shouldn't stay? There is a very important conference on at the moment. There's a lot of important persons, and you don't exactly look like you fit in. That is all. What exactly do you do? I'm an artist. I'm here on the two-week art course, Stroke Holiday, and I arrived here a day early. That is so. Anything else? You're not a journalist by any state? Those dreadful Zeichtang, I hate them. No, no, I assure you, I'm an artist. I paint in watercolours and love watching the world go by. All right. We shall say goodbye to you tomorrow morning, Herr Englander. Till then, auf Wiedersehen. He spins round and walks out of the bar. Another chap promptly taps me on the shoulder. Excuse me, how do you know Herr von Rottenberg? I don't. However, I'm staying at his hotel up the road. Good, very good. We shall look forward to seeing you at the conference. What's your speciality? En plein air, I reply. He looked puzzled. I avoid everybody till the next day and check out quickly. After all, it's a German hotel and I'm a Brit in Spain. Makes sense? Nein? The journey by train to my next port of call is without incident. That is, until I get out of the station and can't find a taxi. There's a small cafe bar with three old men sipping beer. Anyone there where I can get a taxi? They continue drinking and talking to each other. When I repeat my question, I get a blunt, Espanol, senor. A taxi. Non a taxi. A thin, wiry chap comes out from behind the bar. There is no taxi here. Well, where can I get one? Or a bus, maybe? I show him the location on my map. Si, si, he nods and then shouts out. Pedro! An even thinner, warrior lad emerges. He says something that sounds suitably Spanish and taps me on the shoulder. Come. I follow him as he mounts a vintage rusty Vespa. 
He has no helmet, so it splutters alive as if suffering from an attack of asthma. As I climb on, hmm. Luckily, I have a small bag, which I clutch with one hand, grabbing the tail rail with the other. Even luckier is the fact it doesn't go very fast. He also seems to know where he's going, and 15 minutes later we drive up the dirt track to my destination. I give him some notes and he tootles off, beeping his rusty horn, while the sheep and goats stop chewing the dry grass to watch him vanish down the track. Chola! You look much or dust. A nice greeting from someone I assume to be the housekeeper. They are by pool, I show. I follow her round the courtyard through an arch to a large pool, and the group sitting around it fully dressed must be English. Hello, old chap. What have you been up to? Vince is cravatted and corduroyed, and it's only about 7, 20, 27 degrees. Unusual method of transport. Local Pedro, no doubt. Correct in one. Maria will show you to her room. Go freshen up and I'll introduce you to everyone. The housemaid takes me back to the house. It's the Spanish equivalent of an old manor house with three floors and I'm on the top floor. It's all oldy worldy with an eclectic range of objects and paintings littered everywhere. My room has a faded quality about it, but it's clean and smells fresh. The views overlooks the field with the sea far off on the horizon and the crickets are chirping away. I like it. There's even a shower concealed behind a curtain, and soon I'm clean, not so faded, and fresh for action. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to offer a few lectures over your painting holiday, and with a bit of luck, do some painting as well, if you let me. Vince does the introductions, but I don't remember most names apart from Harriet and the Michael, although I think they are two of them, and they used to have great staff in my gallery. Oh, dearie me, they were the best. They used to tell me who was who. Now, rosé wine is served and Vince runs through the itinerary for the next ten days. Oh dear, breakfast at seven again with lectures starting promptly at eight. I've never been my best at this hour of the day. You might ask how come I can talk about painting so authoritarily and only having been a practising artist for a couple of years? Well, put it like this. Twenty years plus spent right behind the artists whose work I was selling and time spent in their studios have helped me immensely. So it's natural to pass on ideas and observations. Strangely, I never see my own work as great art, but then it's not up to me. Others like it and they buy it, so who am I to complain? The one common thing with painters is that the sense of never being satisfied, which I suppose helps drive us on. The first lesson is a gentle warm-up, mixing colours and vanishing points. Men get perspective and women get colour. For us men, it's the hunter instinct. Maybe I'll find a cave when I return and leave supermarkets alone in future. The lesson concludes and we head for the trusty old transit still held together by string as well as something unknown to most garages, sheer luck. First port of call is Alcudia, an ancient walled town with a bull ring just outside. Remind me to avoid that. The square is buzzing with cafes and bars spilling out and the world is chattering away with itself. We order drinks and disperse to sketch. Across the table from where I'm sitting is a young dad with his daughter attempting to spoon feed her a rather large ice cream. There is more on her face and dress and appears to be going in. For some reason she must be the only child ever born who doesn't like ice cream. May I take a photo? I'll send you a copy. She looks gorgeous. Perfect picture. Hurry, before my wife returns. She won't be impressed. The little girl stops her battle and beams looking at my camera. Takes after her mum. Proper model. Image taken, I help him both clean up the mess just in time as said wife returns with two shopping bags. Mama, the daughter raises her arms as if having missed her mother for decades. Thanks, Dad says with a thumbs up. My pleasure. Who's that, says the wife. Oh, he's just an artist out here. Nice chap. Fine, let's go, she says. Bye, I wave and the little girl sticks her tongue out. That's gratitude for you. I return to enjoying the solitude in the crowd of uninterrupted couple of hours. Vince strolls by. I say, old boy, you've come on a bit. It's called practice, just as you told me to do. I do miss your gallery. Well, I'm not going to stop you looking me up for lunches any time you like. Besides, I'll always help you hang shows if you do. Well, that's exactly what I'd like to talk to you about. I've been asked to host a show at my club in London. I'm your man. I knew I could rely on you. Vince, happy, walks away to visit the other group members and casts his beady and hopefully encouraging eye over their works. For a moment, I lose myself in the thoughts of a former gallery owner who's exchanged a vibrant, constantly on-the-go lifestyle to one spent sitting, watching the world go by 
and channeling all his energy down the barrel of a brush, trying to make a piece of paper into a reflection of what my eyes can see. Some of the artists I used to represent have gone now, but I can still hear them giving me hints, paint what you see, not what you know, or look, look, and look some more. But none of the friends from my past ever explained how you feel inside. It's an unusual solitude, plenty of time spent alone, but not lonely. The polar opposites of running the gallery. Do I miss my old life? Well, in truth, after applying a cool blue wash on the wall I'm painting, the answer is a resounding no. However, late lunches, whining, the occasional chat up still goes on. So yes, being the artist is fun in a different way. I fed my mind, so it's back to painting. A beautiful old wooden door surrounded by a huge many layered stone arch. There are a couple sitting on the bench to the left of the door. They kiss. That's the title of my painting. Better than the screen. Time flies until I hear Vince surrounding up the gang. Lunch will be served back at the house. And not forgetting copious glasses of rosé, I titter to myself. Sunshine, painting, food and wine leads to only one thing, a nap till three. Refreshed and ready to give my first talk, constrained by Vince's instruction to keep it clean. Moi? There's that little knot in the stomach and off I go. Ask me to remember exactly what I talk about in the hindsight? I've no idea. But I'm bombarded by questions, including the most important one. Will you make a cocktail like the last time in Tuscany? My infamy follows me. Beatrice is a lovely, petite, perfect size six Jaeger, an octogenarian with sparkly green eyes. She glides up to me and puts her arm through mine. Young man, I really enjoyed your talk. You have a naive approach to life, I believe. Madam, I don't believe I ever want to grow up. Me neither, but call me B, she whispered it confidingly. I blush and have to compose myself. You'll have to give me some of your secrets. Younger men, my dear, can't be bothered with old fogies. Life's too short, you know. I'm being chatted up. What's not to love? Act seven, scene two. Is it selfish being an artist? I used to ask that of my artists in my gallery days, and most reply with some variant or reciprocal question, what do you mean by selfish? I walk down into a field. I've been given permission to enter by the owner and continue along the dusty track, surrounded by clucking hens and cockerels. I spy an old pre-war, a pre-war car, a Citroen, exposed to the elements as the covering tarpaulin has multiple holes and weeds growing through, which make it a very interesting object to paint. I set up my store and I begin. It's rather warm and dry, and I'm delighted to say my trusty second-hand hat is working a treat. A cock emerges through the tall grass and takes a peck at my paints, followed by another, and suddenly the place is awash with feathered folk attacking everything. No amount of shushing and flapping my arms works. These birds mean serious business and seem to have a taste for watercolour blocks. Did you hear that? As I try to gather up my equipment, an elderly chap who looks as dusty as the path, accompanied by a scrawny mutt, slowly strolls up to me. He starts talking in some dialect that I don't know. The dog just growls and wheezes. I'm afraid I've no idea what you are saying. I'm a painter under attack. He starts gesticulating at the car and at the birds, and then more vigorously at me. The penny drops. I realise I'm invading the nesting ground of the Shagadelic Palace for the cockerels. The old man is still pointing at me. I have permission to be here. Mad Englander, comes a reply I can understand, while the dog's growling grows louder and now he's clearly snarling. See, painting outdoors is not as carefree as one would like. I gather up my stuff and begin to walk back to the gate. The old man spits at the ground and there's an ominous metallic click behind me. I turn around to find him pointing a gun at me. It looks like a semi-automatic pistol. I'm a little more than concerned. What's that expression? Smell it? Mate, I'm sitting in it. He indicates with the gun to move, and I follow orders. We walk away from the gate and down the hill to the other side of the field. The dog keeps growling. Eventually we come across a run-down stone hut with an old brown wooden door hanging off its hinges. There are old tools, broken farm machinery and scrap metal everywhere, and an abundance of chickens all over the place. A couple of rusty buckets hang from the guttering, which make an interesting rustic exhibit in the garden centre. We walk into the dark interior and he points to a stool, which I duly sit down on. 
The dog places itself beside me and collapses to the floor. He starts shouting at me and I've no idea what he's ranting on about. Then an elderly woman shuffles into the room. She's quite stooped and her hands are gnarled. Hola, senor. You would like something to drink? Why has he got a gun trained on me? He'd not trust anyone, especially men. But all I was doing was painting that old wreck. I wasn't going to pinch it. He the old guard. Franco, his hero. With that, the man straightens up, beats his chest and then spits on the floor. Please tell him to put the gun away. She utters something to him and he turns and walks out in disgust. The dog follows, still growling. She pours a milky liquid out of a pot and offers me a stone beaker. Here, hojata, drink. I don't drink milk, but feel like I shouldn't mention that. He's good, she nods at me. I try it. It's sweet and refreshing. Show me, signor, artista suspidiola. I get the gist of what she's asking and reach down for my pad. Somehow, I still feel I'm under house arrest. Here you go, and I pass it to her. She studies each page, nodding. Bueno. She looks up and asks me to paint her home. At least I think that's what she says. OK, pronto or mañana? Oh, is a hora, non pronto. Oh, OK. I stand, picking up my bag and walk to the entrance. Momento. She finds a huge parasol and cushion and follows. I have a guard with me now, which is worrying. Strolling around outside, looking for the perfect viewpoint of the wrecked cottage, I spy the old chap not that far away. Hmm. This is a good spot. So I stop and I set up. The woman throws the cushion down behind me and puts the parasol up. She sits to observe me in action. Slowly, the painting comes to life. It's a hive of red beaks, rust and ramshackling building in a scorched field landscape. Actually, I'm quite pleased with it. The woman has not uttered one word so far. And a couple of hours pass. And then with one more dash of red beak, I'm satisfied. Finished. Finito. The woman slowly gets up and scans a home and then the painting and then the home again is good, no? Is good, yes, I reply. It's the first time she smiles since our initial encounter. I know what's coming next. I have? It's more a statement than a question. Only if I can finish painting the old car automobile, yes? Goshe, she replies. See, si, car. No man, no gun. See, si, is okay. I'm still not convinced. I hand her the painting and she walks off home with an air of accomplishment. Meanwhile, I eyeball the chap as I trudge back up to the hill to my original destination. I find the place and I set up again. I feel like everything is watching me. Birds, man, dog and even the fielder's eyes. It's uncomfortable. Slowly a cock struts up and pecks at the watercolour box. This time I ignore him and the companions follow. I'll just accept being surrounded by inquisitive future cock of vin. However, I do manage to complete the picture without strangling one bird in the process. The sun is beginning to cast long shadows. Mosquito time. They love me. I hate them. I pack up and beat a hasty retreat to my lodgings. Someday, someday. I don't believe anyone would believe it. Forced at gunpoint to paint a commission without pay. But the rest of my break then surprisingly passes without any drama at all. Much to my delight. It is replete with plenty of wine, painting and even relaxing. Dare I describe it as idyllic? Sadly, it's soon time to return to England. Victor drives me to the airport after parking up, pulls at my arm. I say, old chap, I must admit to missing you and your gallery. Like I said before, I'll do lunch any time. Come and visit, come and stay even. Besides, I'm going to be helping you with your next exhibition. So what are you worrying about? Victor considers for a moment. When he speaks again, he has a serious tone in his voice. That's just it. Actually, I have something to tell you. As a matter of fact, I'm not in the best of health. I'm sure it'll be OK, but I thought I'd let you know. Care to amplify that statement, Victor? I know him too well to push. I'll let you know when I've seen the specialist, he says. Not a word to anyone. He shakes my hand and saunters off, leaving me deeply concerned. Thank you.